Hello everyone and welcome to week five. We are one third of the way through our semester so far. Time is going very quickly. Before we begin our textbook unit, I have some good news for everyone. The university has recently relaxed its policy about the class time limit. From now on, you are going to have one week to complete all of your assignments and quizzes. I understand that it's very difficult for students to complete all of their work for these online classes, especially if you have too much work. So, all of your assignments and quizzes will have an extended due date. Also, you might have noticed that the quizzes have become a little bit shorter. Instead of 15 questions, they are now 10 questions, and the time limit has been removed. Also, you can retake the assignment quiz, uh, sorry, the attendance quiz an unlimited number of times, and I will take the final score at the end. The attendance quiz is a really good opportunity to practice the same questions over and over again in case you made a mistake. Let's talk about the one week deadline for your assignments. Let's say, for example, you have a class on Monday at 9 a.m. The assignment will start at 9 a.m. on Monday at the beginning of your class. You will have one complete week to finish your work, and then the assignment will close at the beginning of your next lecture. So open Monday 9 a.m close next Monday, 9 a.m. Hopefully this will give you lots of time to complete all of your work carefully without feeling too rushed or too stressed. Okay, now let's talk about today's unit. We're going to talk about products, things that we buy, things that we design, things that we really love. First, we will start with five Fun product quiz questions. Take out a notepad and write down your answers. See how much you know about these products. Number one. Baskin Robbins tried to sell which strange flavor of ice cream? A. Green tea. B. Ketchup. C. Soy sauce. Or D. Honey. The answer is ketchup. Yes, they tried to make a ketchup ice cream, but it wasn't really that successful. If you go to Canada, you can buy ketchup flavored potato chips and actually they taste really amazing. Okay, number two. How many products did Amazon sell in 2018? Was it A, 1 billion, B, 2 billion, C, 3 billion, or D, 20 billion products? Remember, this includes Amazon around the world. So Amazon in America, in Canada, in the UK, everywhere. Okay, did you choose your answer? The correct answer is 3 billion products to over 300 million customers. That is a lot of product to sell in just one year. It's no wonder that Amazon has become such a big company. Next question. What is the top selling product in history of all time? A, the original PlayStation. B, Toyota Corolla. C, the iPad, or D, Lipitor, which is a cholesterol managing medication. Okay, the final answer is PlayStation. The original PlayStation sold over 344 million consoles. Ooh, that took me some time. That is a lot. And it was a really big breakthrough in gaming. It represented a huge technological innovation. It was the first console with 3D graphics. 
Okay, next. What product was created by Germany during World War II? A. Peanut butter. B. The flashlight. C. Vaseline. Or D. Fanta. The answer is Fanta, believe it or not. The delicious orange soda. Do you know which clothing designer also came out of Germany during World War II? This clothing designer made Nazi uniforms, but now they make cologne, they make menswear, they make all sorts of things. This company is Hugo Boss. Very strange. Okay, our final question. If McDonald's sells 75 hamburgers every second, how much of this product do they sell every day? Maybe you can do the math very quickly. Well, every day they sell 6,480,000 hamburgers. That is a lot of burgers in one day. I wonder how many calories that is. Okay, now let's take a look at the beginning of our unit. Before we start looking at vocabulary, we'll get our mind thinking about products and the different kinds of products that there are. Imagine that you were shopping on Amazon.com and someone gave you a gift card of $200. You can buy anything you want. So my question is, what kind of products are the most interesting to you? Which ones interest you the most and why? For example, do you look at cosmetics first, stationery, automotive accessories, electronics, sporting goods, clothes, home decor, or maybe something else? Please take out your notebook and write your answer in a complete sentence. Now, I'd like you to continue writing in your notebook. Do you agree or disagree with these statements and why? Number one, it is better to pay a bit more for products made in your own country. Number two, eco or green products are overpriced and often not as good. And number three, oh, Sorry, I should say number three. Multinational companies which manufacture in poor countries help the world economy. Okay, take your notebook and write your answers. Now let's look at today's vocabulary. Today's vocabulary is focused on adjectives that we will use to describe different products. Let's listen and repeat. Attractive, comfortable, economical, efficient, expensive, fashionable, popular, practical, pure, reliable, safe, healthy. Okay, maybe you already know some of these words. Today we're going to combine these adjectives with nouns to make a word combination. So, let's look in your textbook. If you don't have a textbook, you can use your notebook. Think of a product that matches each word. Then we're going to compare answers, your answers and my answers. How many were the same? Okay, so go ahead, look at each word. An attractive, hmm. And remember, use a product, not just any noun. You can't say uh, an attractive woman. She's not a product. So maybe an attractive painting or an attractive decor. Okay, so look at all of the adjectives and make a word combination. When you come back, we'll compare our answers.
All right, welcome back. Let's compare your answers with mine. I thought of an attractive home. Especially when we are selling real estate, we want to make the house look very inviting and attractive. Comfortable shoes, very important. Economical cars, especially when we talk about gas economy. Does it have a good mileage for its gas requirement? Efficient lamps or efficient light bulbs. Expensive watches. Everyone loves a nice expensive watch. Fashionable clothes. Popular cosmetics. Practical furniture, because furniture is very practical. Pure water. Reliable phones. Safe bicycles. And healthy foods. These are just some examples, and you can make so many different product combinations with these adjectives. If you go on Amazon and you look at some different products, I'm sure you'll see examples of these adjectives being used. These are all really common adjectives when used to describe products. Now, we are going to make some sentences by filling in the blank. We have a box with some words. This is the same as in the textbook. So if you don't have the textbook, you can use this PowerPoint slide. Take each word and fill in the blank. Then we're going to make some adjective combinations. When you finish, we'll check your answers. Okay, let's check our answers. Number one. IBM manufactures high-tech computer products. Number two, Timberland makes a range of hard-wearing footwear. That means footwear that is very strong and won't break easily. Number three, Hermes produces high-quality fashion accessories. Number four, Coca-Cola and Pepsi both developed best-selling soft drinks. Number five, Duracell sells long-lasting batteries. Number six, Levi jeans are a well-made clothing product. And seven, Ferrari make high-performance cars. You'll notice that the word high is a very popular adjective to use. High-tech, high-quality, high-performance. These are very popular descriptions for products. Now the next part. We are going to use these words that we made, best selling, high quality, high performance, and I want you to combine it with different companies and products from your own mind. So let's say for example, M makes best selling cell phones. Which company would you put there? Apple, Samsung, uh, Huawei, you can choose. Okay, so go ahead, take out your notebook and make a sentence using these words. Pick a company and a product. Fantastic, hopefully you thought of some really good products and companies. Next, we're going to match some verbs with their meaning. So take a look at this list of verbs. Let's listen and repeat. Launch, test, promote, manufacture, modify, discontinue, design, distribute, or in some cases, distribute. Different countries pronounce it different ways. So, what is something that you notice about all of these verbs? Well, all of these verbs are parts of the product uh, life cycle. So, how do we make a product? How do we design it and then send it out to a customer? So, take a look at each verb and then try to match it with the meaning. When you come back, we'll check your answers.
Okay, let's check your answers. Number one, to launch means to introduce a product to the market. You'll often hear about product launches at trade shows. For example, last week we talked about E3, the major gaming trade show. At these trade shows, they will have product launches, launches, not lunch, launch for new games or new consoles that will soon appear in the market. Number two, test to try something to see how it works. Three, promote to increase sales by advertising. Promotion is marketing. We need people to know about the product so that they will buy it. Number four, manufacture to build or make. Manu, hand, facture, make, to make by hand. Nowadays, we make everything in a factory. Number five, modify, to change in order to improve. We can also say to update or upgrade. Number six, discontinue, to stop making. For example, let's say, the Samsung Note 7 is discontinued. They don't make it anymore. Number seven, design, to make a plan or a drawing. And eight, distribute or distribute, to supply to shops, companies, customers, etc. To send the product to the vendors. Okay, so now that we've learned all of the verbs that describe the process of creating a product, we now need to put the verbs in the correct order to show the life cycle of the product. I've put each of these verbs here with an image to help you visualize the process. In your notebook, please number each verb in the correct order. What is the first step to creating a new product? When you come back, we'll check your answers. Welcome back. Let's describe the life cycle of a product. When we make a new product, the first thing we need to do is design it. We need to plan what it will do, what it will look like, and how the different parts will work together to make this product. After we figure out all of the planning, we can begin to test the design. The testing phase will usually repeat many, many times because we are going to solve some problems and try it again, then change this, test it again, change that, test it again. We might also test the product with some sample customers. These are just random people who are going to test the product and give some feedback about it. Maybe it's not very comfortable to use, or maybe it makes a loud noise and they don't like that. We call this a test group, a group of people who will test a new product. After we test it many, many times, and we have found the perfect version of this product, we are ready to manufacture it for a sale on the global market. We're ready to make a lot of them and sell them. So now we have a big inventory of our new product. How can we introduce it to the market? Well, we have a product launch. This can happen in a trade show or sometimes there are promotional events online. There are many different ways to launch a product. But by launching it, we introduce it to the world. It's important to have your inventory ready before a launch so that you can keep up with demand as soon as the product enters the market. Then after we announce the product, we need to pro, uh, distribute it to all of the stores that we want to sell it. It needs to be available for people to buy it when they hear about it. 
Then once all of our inventory is ready and prepared and ready to be sold in the store, we promote it. We get people into the stores to buy the product. We can do social media marketing. We can air an advertisement on TV. We can make radio commercials. We can make flyers and posters. There are so many different kinds of promotional techniques. Then after we've sold the product for some time, we might realize that some things need to change. Maybe we want to keep this product for a very long time. For example, the iPhone. The iPhone has existed for many, many years, but they are constantly modifying it, improving it, adding new features so that the product line, this family of products, can continue for a long time. However, at the end, when we want to retire a product, we will discontinue it. This is the complete life cycle of a product. Now let's get ready for the listening part of today's lesson. Don't forget that the listening files are all available on YouTube. Today's track is CD2 track 62. And this audio file is 1 minute and 16 seconds long. So it's very short. You're going to listen to James Wallman, who was the ed editor of LSN, a news network which follows trends and innovations in the retail and technology sectors. Remember we talked about innovations, great ideas. So he is an expert in innovations. Listen to the first part and complete his notes for answering the question, what makes a product great? One, it should be easy to what? Two, it should solve a mm or fulfill a mm. And there is an example. Three, it should be mm and make your life mm and make things mm. Okay, so please go ahead and listen to the audio on YouTube. When you come back, we'll check your answers. Great, let's check your answers. Number one, the product should be easy to use. If it's too complicated, the customer is going to grow frustrated very quickly. Number two, it should solve a problem or fulfill a need. For example, electric cars. Right now, there is a need to lower our greenhouse gas emissions and find renewable sources of energy. And number three, it should be functional, in other words, useful, and make your life easier and make things better. No one wants a product that's going to be inconvenient and difficult to use. Now let's listen to the second part, which is track 63. Correct the three mistakes in his summary. If you don't have the textbook, you can look at the summary, which I've typed for you in this PowerPoint. When you come back, we'll check your answers. Welcome back. Let's check your answers. There are three errors in this summary. The errors are this. It's the new electric vehicle, not gas. Um, and it can go from zero to 60 miles per hour in 3.4 seconds. That is a lot faster than 34 seconds. And then he drove uh, in France from Nice to Cannes. And you can see Nice is spelled N-I-C-E. If you didn't get the spelling right, that's okay, because this is a French word, so it's uh, understandable if you didn't know the spelling. Okay, now let's listen to the third part and answer these questions. One, what product does James expect to see? Two, what does he sometimes not like about driving? Three, where does he not like driving? 
4. Which companies are mentioned? And 5. What is the comparison with the 747 plane? When you come back, we'll check your answers. Okay, let's check your answers to D, which is part of our listening. Number one, what product does James expect to see? He expects to see driverless cars. Maybe you've heard about these on your own. For example, they've begun testing driverless trucks to ship products on the highways. Very interesting stuff. Number two, what does he sometimes not like about driving? It can be boring and a pain. Yes, it can be very inconvenient. Number three, where does he not like driving? In cities. I'm sure if you drive, you can agree. Driving in cities is a huge inconvenience and very frustrating. Number four, which companies are mentioned? General Motors, Google, and Audi. Number five, what is the comparison with the 747 plane? You can drive it or the machine can drive. Very interesting concepts. Now, E, listening. We're going to listen to track 65 now. Listen to the final part and complete the information about James Wallman. His favorite product, the color of this product, his job, what he is writing, and he uses Skype to talk to friends in what places. When you come back, we'll check your answers. Welcome back. Let's check your answers. His favorite product, his Mac computer. It is black. His job is a journalist and he is writing a novel. He uses Skype to talk to his friends in New York and Australia, very far away places. Okay, next we have some reading in our textbook. Unfortunately, I cannot upload this article to the PowerPoint, so if you do have the textbook, please share a photo of this article with other students who do not have access to the textbook. I'm really sorry about that, and I really wish that I could upload a digital version of the textbook. Um, I've looked into it and I've tried, but unfortunately I'm not allowed to do that. So if you do have the textbook, please share with other students. Okay, after you read the article, please answer these five questions. When you come back, we'll check your answers. Welcome back. Let's start with the first three questions. Number one, give three examples of problems for the Japanese consumer electronic industry. One, the yen's strength. Two, the economy's weakness or the collapse of Japanese mobile phone sales. Number two, four examples of Casio's products. Radio controlled watches, G-Shock watches, high-speed digital cameras, electronic calculators, etc. Three, two examples of major players, in other words, important companies, in professional photography. Canon and Nikon. These are definitely the two biggest companies in photography today. Next, number four. Two of Mr. Cascio's favorite expressions preconceived ideas, and from zero to one. Number five, three examples of arrivals to Japan's electronic industry, Taiwan, China, and South Korea. So lots of competition in the electronics industry, especially in East Asia. Now let's talk about today's grammar on page 116. This week, we're going to learn about passives. We also sometimes call this the passive voice. But what is it and how do we use it? First, 
we make passive verb forms with the verb be and the past participle. Let's look at an example. The Casio G-Shock GW5000 mm, in Japan. So we want to change the verb make into the passive voice. So first we need the be verb, the watch is, and then the past participle made. It is made in Japan. So in the sentence, we're describing where it is made, the process of making this watch. We use passive verb forms to talk about objects or people who experience an action. So for example, a watch cannot make, it is just an object. So we need to use the passive voice to use this verb in connection to this object. Let me show a visual to make this a little more clear. Imagine there is a murder. There are two people involved in this story. Number one, we have the active voice. The active voice is the voice that we usually use with verbs. In other words, it performs the action. John killed Michael. We have the active form of kill. John killed Michael. He did the action. The second person is passive. They're not moving. They're not doing anything. They're not doing any action. Instead, they experience the action. So we need our be verb and past participle. Michael was killed by John. Okay, he's receiving the action. You might have noticed this little word here, by. We can use the word by, sorry, we can use the word by to describe who did the action. Let's practice making a passive voice sentence together. This lens use in skateboarding photo shots. First be verb, this lens is past participle used. The past participle is often very similar to the past simple past tense of the verb, but there are some that are different. So you need to memorize these exceptions. Okay, if we want to say who performed the action, we can use by. For example, Michael was killed by John. Let's practice making a sentence together. The professional photography market dominate Canon and Nikon. So first, our be verb is dominate, dominated by. The professional photography market is dominated by Canon and Nikon. We can also use the passive voice to describe a process, system, or procedure. For example, finally, all Casio products are tested before shipping. Notice how the be verb always matches our subject. Here, there are many watches. Many watches are tested before shipping. Let's make another one. The best apples are selected and are sent to local markets. We can use the passive to describe a process, system, or procedure from the past as well. In fact, we can use the passive voice with any verb tense by changing the tense of the be verb. So let's take a look. The telephone past be verb was. The telephone was invented in 1876. Apple Mac computers past be verb in the plural were first produced in 1984. Now let's 
practice in your textbook, Exercise A. In Exercise A, you will see a chart with three different categories. Use this chart to make five passive sentences. You can combine the products, the verbs, and the countries in ways that you think make sense. Please write these sentences in your notebook. When you finish, we'll check your answers. Okay, hopefully you wrote some good sentences. If the sentences are not factually true, that's okay because we're just practicing our grammar right now. So, let's look at some example sentences. I will show you five examples, but you can write any combination that you want. Number one, diamonds are mined in South Africa. Here we have a present tense because we're describing a fact that is currently true. Next, microchips are produced in the United States. Also a fact, so we use present tense. Rice is grown in China, also true. It is a fact, so we use present tense. It is something that is still ongoing all the time. Electronic goods are produced in Japan. Coffee is grown in Brazil. Okay, now let's look at exercise B, which is on the same page in your textbook. In this exercise, you must change the sentences from the active into the passive so that they sound more natural. If you don't have a textbook, I have written the sentences here. So please complete the exercise in your notebook. When you finish, we will check your answers. Okay, let's check your answers. Number one. Well, we'll just check all of them at once. Number one, the channel tunnel was opened in 1994. You don't need to include by somebody because it's not really adding any extra detail. So you can just re uh, remove that. Number two, the new design was chosen or the new design was chosen by them. Again, this detail is not really very useful, so you can delete it. Three, this website is seen by thousands of people every day. Number four, the staff were asked for their opinions by the employers. Notice how we keep the same verb tense, okay, past tense. The employers asked, the staff were asked. If you ever get a question like this on a test or exam, you should always match the verb tense. Number five is a really good example of this. So first we said, a mechanic is repairing my car at the moment. This verb tense is the present continuous, is repairing right now. The present continuous of be is, is being. It's a little strange, but this is how we make the passive present continuous. My car is being repaired by a mechanic at this moment. Number six, the verb tense, somebody has found. This is the present perfect, right? We have an auxiliary verb in the present tense and a past participle, has found. Here we're going to make it the passive voice, present perfect. The missing file has been found. And finally, an easy one, this was made in Switzerland. Okay, so always be careful about the verb tense, especially these more complex tenses like the present continuous and present perfect. Okay, now we're going to talk about products. Is something interesting that we can think about is product flops. A product that fails is called a flop. 
We can also say it was dead in the water. Dead in the water means it was destined to, pay, to fail. It failed from the beginning. The idea was so bad, the planning was so terrible, that it had no chance to succeed. It was dead in the water. There are many reasons why a product might flop. In hindsight, it might seem obvious. So if you look back, it seems really obvious. But in reality, it can be difficult to predict. So, it could be a problem with the marketing. Maybe it wasn't marketed properly or to the right group of people. Maybe the quality was too low and it turned customers away. Or it cost too much to manufacture and the company couldn't earn enough of a profit. It could be a product that was just a fad and then quickly exploded and then disappeared without having a potential for a long life in its life, product life cycle. Or maybe it was so poorly planned or managed that even though it was a good product, it was destined to be a disaster because it wasn't properly managed. So let's take a look at some examples of product flops. Maybe you've seen this before, Colgate toothpaste. This is definitely one of the main toothpaste brands in America. But did you know that they tried to sell food, frozen food, actually, and you can see the logo on the boxes. The frozen food market was already saturated when these dinners were released in 1982. So they were trying to release a product in a market that was already very full. And apparently, connecting the taste of food and toothpaste is a bad idea. So their timing was wrong. Their marketing idea was very strange. And the product, maybe the food tasted good, but in the mind of the customer, the product concept was just too strange. So there were many problems with this product. There are some other more recent product flops that you probably know. Um, for example, purple ketchup, Google Glass, 3D TV, it was such a big idea, but what happened to it? And the Samsung Galaxy Note 7, which exploded on planes everywhere and caused a big stir. So each of these products failed for different reasons, and they all probably had multiple reasons for their failure. For this week's participation work, I want you to do a little bit of research on product flops. There are four steps to this assignment. One, describe a failed product using passives. You can talk about the launch date, the place of manufacture, it was made in Japan, the design process, uh, it was designed by so-and-so, etc. And if you remember this example, we have some passive voices, a uh, passive voice. The market was saturated. These dinners were released in 1982. So use a passive to describe the product. Tell me what it is, when it happened, and what it's all about. Then I want you to tell me why you think the product failed. Explain. Was it a marketing problem? Was it a, an advertising problem? Was the product just not good? Number three, how would you modify the product to make it successful? You can also modify something else like the marketing campaign or maybe the timing of the product wasn't good. And four, what are some other brands that succeeded? What did they do differently? So to go back to our example of 
<laughs> Colgate frozen food, another example of a product that uh, of a brand that succeeded is like Crest. They succeeded because they never tried to make food. They knew that wasn't a good idea. Okay, so uh, this is designed to be a pretty fun assignment for you. I want you to enjoy looking at all of these crazy products that for some reason someone thought was a good idea to sell. There are many different products that you can choose from. Okay, when you go on YSEC, you're going to find the assignment and it will be a simple Word document like this. It's just one page long and it's not too complex. So don't worry about having a huge essay. It's just a few paragraphs. So first, please choose your course. You can simply delete the, the, the other course, okay? Just so I know exactly where your assignment belongs, fill in your name, your student ID, and an image of the product. You can use any of the failed products that are mentioned in this lecture, or you can find a new one. I really encourage you to look for new ones because there are so many funny products out there and it's just so interesting to look at them. Okay, so pick any kind of failed product you want. It can be a failed uh, modification of a product that still exists, or it can be a product that never even succeeded the launch, okay? Just give me a thorough explanation of what it is, what it was supposed to do, and why it failed. Okay. Now that we have that under our belt, let's move on to our office culture moment. So we learned about product flops. How about employee flops? What if you make a mistake at work, something really terrible? How can we recover from a situation like that? How can you turn a negative situation into a positive one? Well, let's first talk about cultural differences. In South Korea and in other East Asian, Asian countries as well, apologizing for a mistake is a really serious affair. Here we have some photos, one of our president, ex-president Park Geun-hye, and on the left, the leader of the Shincheonji church who recently apologized for the whole coronavirus situation. You can tell just by their body language that their apology is very serious and very heavy. They're apologizing for really terrible things that happened. But in North America, the culture of apology is a little different. It's not quite so serious. And there are different types of problems that we should apologize for. So we're going to talk about how to make an apology uh, in English and how to react to um, American apology culture. So let's first think about your situation. Imagine you're at work and suddenly you realize, oh no, I messed up. Before you panic, there are some questions you should ask yourself to decide how serious of a problem it really is. Number one, was it an accident or was I rude? Okay, and being rude can also be an accident, especially if there is a cultural misunderstanding or a cultural difference. So you really need to think about how much was intentional and how much was just the situation. Number three, was it a misunderstanding? Did I say something in a way that made the other person misunderstand me? Was it a cultural misunderstanding? Was it a miscommunication? There are so many accidents that can happen. Number four, who was affected? How many people were affected 
And also where in the company does that person work? Five, what was my role in it? And you really need to be honest. What did I do and how did I create this situation? And six, how bad are the consequences? Is it really very serious? Or maybe I feel terrible, but actually it's not such a big deal. If you're like me, you might feel very stressed and anxious about a very small mistake. So if you make a big mistake uh, and you asked yourself all of these questions and you realized, oh my God, it was my fault. I did something really terrible. I was so rude. I made a mistake that was a huge problem for my company. Then the thing you need to do is take responsibility. This can be really scary, but you need to be brave. You need to accept the consequences gracefully and especially focus on a solution. You can look at this infographic to help you think about what to do for a big mistake. I think the number one thing about a big mistake is that you should apologize immediately. Don't let the mistake hang over your head for a week. You need to solve the problem as soon as you can. Don't give excuses and say, well, it happened because of this, it happened because of that. Just say, I'm sorry about this problem. I know I did this. I'm going to do this in the future. Okay, explain a solution. Give your plan. And then you have to actually follow through on what you said. That means you need to really do it. Don't just say sorry and then forget about it. There is a very important part of, of an apology, which is action. I'm, and I mean long-term action or change. That is a really important part of an apology. And also we should decide if we will apologize in person or by email. Of course, the more serious it is, the more we should talk to them in person. Okay, but I'm sure that these rules are pretty similar to apologizing in a Korean cultural environment, right? Now let's talk about small mistakes. If you make a small mistake, you can always be positive. Don't say sorry, say thank you. Now, what does that mean? I'm not saying that you shouldn't apologize. Of course, you should apologize. But you can apologize in a more constructive way by using these types of expressions. So let's take a look. Let's say you made a small mistake, like you were a little bit late, like five minutes late. Instead of saying, I apologize for the delay, you can say, thank you for your patience. I'm sorry for talking too much or too long. Instead, say, thank you for listening. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to go, I'm busy right now. You can instead say, thank you for your time. Uh, I need to go now, but thank you for talking to me and I'll talk to you again later. I'm sorry for being late. You can say, thank you so much for waiting. The reason why we should say thank you instead of sorry in this situation is that one, you acknowledge the other person's inconvenience. By saying thank you for waiting, you're letting them know that yes, I acknowledge that I made you wait. And you make them feel appreciated for the sacrifice that they made. Three, it shows that you accept responsibility for what happened but that you accept it confidently and you're able to move forward from the situation. Don't get stuck in your mistake and talk about yourself negatively. We can acknowledge a mistake, but still move forward with a positive attitude. And this positive energy will affect how the other person will perceive the situation. And finally, it 
talks about the problem as something situational and not a personal flaw. And that's really important. We want to objectify the problem. Let's look at an example. Here we have uh, two people who are meeting and one person is late. In the first example, she says, thank you for your patience. And the other person says, cool. In the second example, they say, sorry, I'm always late. And the other person is annoyed. Why? In the first example, when you enter in, uh, maybe you're a little late and the person is a little annoyed, but you come in with a big smile and you say, thank you for waiting for me. They're going to feel a little annoyed, but they'll think, I waited a long time, but they seem polite and helpful. It gives them a positive boost to start changing their reaction. In the other situation, you come in negative and the other person is already feeling pretty bad because they waited a long time. When you say, sorry, I'm always late, you make them feel like, yeah, you are always late. You disappointed me again. And it reinforces the negative parts of the situation. So even though these people made the same mistake, the way that they apologized changed the energy of the situation completely. By saying thank you and introducing a positive energy, this person is able to improve the situation automatically. This is a technique that is often used in customer service. So imagine you're calling the airline because you want to cancel your plane ticket and you waited for three hours on the phone. The person who answers is going to say, thank you so much for waiting, how can I help you? They're not going to say, I'm so sorry, I know it's very long. If they do, then they start the conversation in a negative tone. So when we apologize for a small mistake, we should, we can look at the pictures here, be very pleasant, okay? Say uh, thank you to the other person as a way of apologizing to them. That gives a positive energy. Then you can explain the situation as neutrally as possible. So for example, if we look here, thank you for your patience. Um, there was a delay in traffic, um, but I am here now. We just explained the context of the situation, but we don't give any blame to anybody. We're just explaining what happened. So explain the situation as neutrally as possible. Then explain the actions that you're taking now to handle the situation. So you acknowledge the other person, you know exactly why the problem happened, and you're going to do something about it. So for example, Thank you for waiting. There was a delay because of traffic. Um, I'm here now and I will stay an extra five minutes to help you solve your problem because of my delay. Then offer your assistance more. Volunteer more. It makes them feel like, oh, I had a little bit of inconvenience, but this person is so helpful and so kind that it doesn't even bother me. So ask if they have any other problems and offer your help. So I have some optional work for you if you want to practice this office culture skill. Um, it's a very similar document to the other one. And if you want, you can fill it in by um, looking at the situation and then writing an apology using this, this um, step-by-step -step instruction. So um, first, of course, choose your course, but this is an optional practice work. However, I think it is a very useful skill. You're not required to submit this for points. However, I am always willing to check your writing. So if you do decide to complete this work, please fill it in and then submit it to YSEC. Then I will take a look uh, I will review your writing and I can give you some feedback. 
If you look at the document, you'll see two different situations. One situation is a big mistake, and one situation is a small mistake. I'll let you read them and decide on your own which one was the big mistake and which one was the small mistake. Then you can review this lecture and write a brief apology using the steps that I showed you. Okay, so in summary, this week we learned about different types of products. We learned adjectives to describe them and verbs to describe the life cycle of a product. We also discussed product flops, products that failed for a variety of reasons. Our grammar point this week was the passive voice or passives. And in our office culture moment, we talked about positive apologies, how to apologize in a positive manner to improve the situation. And in reminder, your participation work today is to research a failed product. You can choose any product you want, including the ones on this lecture, and you will submit the document directly to YSEC. Okay, that's it for this week's lecture. Thank you so much for all of your hard work, and I hope you have a very great week. Thank you very much. Goodbye.